All right, let's continue. This is the big one. How do the global ledgers and settlement work today? This is what I've been getting at the whole video. People have probably been standing around saying, when are you going to get to it? How complex could it be? But it's important to lay the groundwork and explain and think about things. It's not me so much explaining it, but just thinking about things like what are securities and how do they work and why are they important and why should we care and how do things trade and what is trade? These are big questions and it's big problems. A lot of people haven't thought about this. I did some research into the academic uh, learning about this. There's a lot of people who have studied money and what makes money worthwhile and commodities. This has been this way for so long, not many people have really studied how settlement works. I could find very few academic papers on this topic, but it's important because it's basically a big chunk of the world's money. So the market made it impossible to manage the way that you saw in the last video when I was talking about managing it by pen and paper or what happened in the Baghdad stock exchange. It, you can't really run something of big scale that way. So as markets grew, it became impossible to manage. And this is very, very important. This is the most important part of this video series is how people think the ledgers work versus how they actually work. So up here we say this is this is how people think it works. A lot of one of the big objections I should have put on that slide earlier is uh, it doesn't make sense to have a token because uh, you, 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 it's not trustless. You, you, you don't trust your issuer. Well, the issuer isn't the trust we're solving for. Nobody's worried Apple's going to steal the shares, although there are problems with central, if, if an issuer even did have it, and I'll explain that on this video. But nobody's worried about Apple stealing the shares or you wouldn't invest in Apple. That's not the centralization we're solving for. We're solving for this other issue. So in real life, the way that it works, it is not that Apple knows who their shareholders are. In 1981, before their IPO, they might have known who their shareholders were. They had a cap table like a lot of startups. And that's why this is particularly common in the tech space, because people are used to their own startup. They're thinking about their ledger. But for publicly traded companies, it doesn't work like that. Apple doesn't have a list that has you on it if you're a shareholder. How does it work? Well, who has that ledger? All right. If you have Apple stock, How do you know that you have that stock? And who has a ledger? You think about it. So if you have 100 shares of Apple, how do you know? Well, you could say, it's on my Charles Schwab account. All right, well, how do you know that they have it? Well, they're regulated. We can trust them. But that's not very cypherpunk. What if there's a flaw in the system, if they're well-meaning? But how do we know they really have it? Do they have shares somewhere? Not really. Do they have a ledger that's Apple, say, Schwab owns it? No. Apple doesn't have there no, just be another shareholder. Apple doesn't have that list. Now, if you take that hundred shares and Bob at Charles Schwab sells it to Alice at Merrill Lynch, how does Merrill Lynch know that Schwab has those shares? How does how do they know? Does Schwab share their ledger? No, that wouldn't do any good anyway. They could forge it, but Schwab would never share that. That's proprietary. Do they go back and report to Apple? No, they don't do that either. How do they do it? They do it through certificates, basically. They're no longer paper, usually, but they were paper, and they're basically digital receipts. And they could not manage it between each party because the volume is so great, it is too hard to manage by trading it back and forth between these parties. It's very counterintuitive. It goes from one broker to another, and and, they, and I'm just... Think about that. You probably have to rewatch the the last we started four minutes ago to go back and, and think about that. How do you do it when you have Bob and Alice at Charles Schwab and Merrill Lynch? It's much more complex than that in the real world. You have Bob and Alice are clients of a pension fund, which has a hedge fund, which is at another firm. And it's not just Schwab and Merrill Lynch. It's UBS and it's thousands and thousands of other firms. And there's global and there's money and there's exchange and there's brokers and there's mutual funds and hedge funds and short sellers and naked short sellers and banks and transfer agents and the sh shareholder relations companies and consultants and brokers and market makers and the exchanges that trade these things and the regulators and so on and so on. It's very, very, very complex. So what happened is, so the, I'm oversimplifying all of this. 
and no one is a real expert on all, all of it. I try and learn what I can. And by the way, I don't have all the answers here, or I don't know if I have any answers. I have some things that I suspect may work, but I had, and I have some understanding of the problem. That's my main motivation with these videos. So what happened is when you had all of these things trading, they used to trade them back and forth by bicycle. And so they would just net it out at the end of the day. They'd say, okay, Merrill Lynch did this and Schwab did that. And there's a net of 10,000 shares here, 12,000 here, net it out 2,000, take it on a bicycle, move it from one broker to another. And they had things called the capital book going back to the uh, Dutch East India Company before where companies would, would work on this. There's transfer agents that would that would say this is really shares that you're going through. Make sure they're not counterfeit. That's pretty much how the system worked for a long, long time, kind of almost going back to the days of Dutch East India Company. Certainly in all modern times throughout the existence of the United States stock market going from the from the Great Depression onward. And that became more and more difficult. By the uh, 50s, there was a lot of bicycles going back and forth. By the 60s, it, it became untenable. And it's fascinating to look at what happened by 1968. The market started closing early every Wednesday just to deal with these large piles of stock certificates that were all over the place. So they just couldn't catch up with volume. They, so then they ended up closing every day. And if you've ever been working in the markets, you know, that's just crazy. You don't close markets, but they did. They just couldn't, they couldn't handle it. And it put them in a lot of pain. So they all got together. They said, we, we've got to solve this. And they put this astronomical amount of money and did something that was as technically advanced as you could with as far as logistics and planning. And they created this centralized entity, which would hold the stocks for, 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 for people. And they would net it out at the end of the day. And it saved the day. Uh, there's a great speech. I should do a, a piece on it of the uh, of of how this kind of unfolded and what was going on, what people were looking at. I mean, it was really, really uh, interesting because it was a big problem of scaling and capacity. And it it solved it temporarily uh, as when new technology comes in and fixes things, more liquidity, more markets, things could be done that couldn't be done before. More capital could be raised. The markets grew again and again and continued. The volume continued up from 3 million to 15 million, and it got really bad by the 70s. And then the 80s was this huge, crazy boom. And by the 90s, they couldn't keep track of who owned what anymore. So they sort of gave up and said, we're going to put it all in one company name. That's CD and Company. So they put everything in CD and Company's name. And that's really, it really is their name. It is legal. Look it up. It's, it's interesting. And that uh, is how uh, things are held. And then you have agreements, which are, uh, uh, you have a, uh, an, an agreement that says you have a claim on an asset with your broker. Your broker has a claim on an asset that's held at CD and Co. Th and maybe through clearing firms and other, and transfer agents, there's a lot of parties in here. Again, very complex. And if this looks silly or bad, or you, and some of the slides I'll show you, if it looks like it's a bunch of incompetent people, that's not the case. These are very competent people. It's very high tech, uh, but it is very complex just because of the w nature of how the markets work. If you think you can map it out, uh, try it. It's hard. So here's another example of how it moves. There's a lot of uh, different parties, market makers, stock exchanges, and so on. I'll try and keep this video f fairly short. So Unfortunately, again, won't go into too, too much detail, but the basic way that I explained it before and what else can show you here pretty much covers it. It is this, you're, you're basically trusting a centralized third party. And this is why databases won't work for this, or you already have a database with a trusted third party. Because if I go back to that initial example and I say, okay, how do you know you have the Apple stock? And you say, oh, Bruce, forget your blockchain, forget your Bitcoin, just replace it with a database. Well, it is a database. But what database would you use and who would hold that? If you looked this through and mapped it out and did the work that has been done over it for decades and decades, you'd come probably to a similar conclusion that the exchanges and all the other parties have come, which is you, you really need, until the blockchain came along, you needed to trust this with a centralized uh, trusted third party. And that's the way it is kind of all over the world. There's Euroclear, there's DTCC, here's how it works in Japan. Uh, this is another way that it is run out by, by geographical area. There's the OMX, NASDAQ, all of these different marketplaces that interact with the clearing system. So you have National Securities Clearing, uh, uh, EuroX, all these other ones. And then you have uh, the depository trust companies, all of these different groups. And then how does it settle? Well, they, this is where Bitcoin could become. Think of this. If Bitcoin replaced this, how would that be? That would be a very interesting 
success for Bitcoin, right? If Bitcoin even replaced 10% of this, it would be absolutely astronomical because right now they can't really communicate. You can't really, in all my years working in this, I, I, I always wished that it was easier to buy stocks of other companies. I thought it would be cool. Now there's problems with this centralized system. So Dole Foods sold 2013 by 2017. When people claimed the shares, they said, okay, we've sold, let me get my $2.74. Dole thought there was 36 million, 793,000 and change out there, but 49 million people, because going back to these days of all these complexities, somewhere in here, somebody, probably accidentally or technology lacking or who knows what, I don't know wh how it happened, but there ended up being more shares outstanding than we thought. This is a great article from Bloomberg that covers that. It talks about, CD, this is great over here, this line, CD and Co., a nominary of depository trust company owns all the stock in all the companies. Right. Okay. DTC keeps the least of its participants. That's banks and brokers who really kind of own that stock, sort of. Okay. And then those participants, so that would be big, big, uh, you know, clearing firms, like National Financial, where Fidelity clears and uh, Pershing and these uh, Mellon, these kind of groups. Okay. These participants, then they keep track of the beneficial owners usually there's another layer on top of that the pools the fun yeah there you go people in funds pools other broker dealers regional broker dealers and then it trickles down to okay it's then it's xyz company and then sometimes there's even another company under that and then it's jane not only is it often jane it might be retirement trust for the benefit of jane so it's very complex you don't really own your stocks which is why it takes days to transfer them between from one area to another so there's drawbacks of this here's another one these ultimately are represented often by things like paper and certainly other weird and centralized systems even the technology ones are just as uh, possibly fraught with with potential risks so here's a here's an article DTC founds it was actually I believe ended up being quite a bit more than the 1.3 million here's something from their own website this is amazing it was a trillion dollars a trillion dollars in certificates were cut were uncovered in a, basically a basement in in uh, downtown New York after Hurricane Sandy. Now, don't let this sound incompetent or anything. It may, you know, you can roll your eyes, and, and but this was this is the way that the system works. That these are very, very capable technical companies that spend a lot of money on this. Until this technology that Bitcoin is based on came along, there hasn't been a way to solve this. So you so the the securities got flooded and they had to take them out. And imagine this, you had armored trucks and guards and things like that. They had to take them over to Jersey City where it seems everything happens and they dried them out. Looks like, you know, one by one in a cleaning room with internal audit and operation staff. Amazing. Yeah, you know, we can do better than that, I think. And I'll talk about that in the next video, how this technology could potentially work uh, to maybe be a solution for this kind of thing.